Hi guys and welcome back to another true crime and makeup time video. If you're new here, my name is Zara and I post a new true crime video every single week. So if you love makeup and you love true crime, definitely think about hitting that subscribe button guys. It would mean so much to me. If you have any cool case suggestions, definitely leave them down below and I hope you enjoy today's video. So today's case is a requested case and it came from Big Kel. So thank you, Big Kel, for this case suggestion. It is about a really young girl who goes to a party and at this party, a group of young boys take turns harassing, beating, mocking, assaulting, and spitting on this poor girl while onlookers at the party stand by and do nothing. It was a crime that shook the close-knit community of Newcastle in Australia and has many still believing, even decades later, that all those who were involved were never really brought to justice. So let's get into today's case. We're going to be talking about Lee Mears or Lee Lee. So Lee Mears was born to her mother, Robin, and her father, Robert, on July 24th, 1975. And she was born in New South Wales, Australia. The area she was born in was known to be like a very industrial area and unemployment was high at the time. And the average family income was pretty low at the time. Her parents got divorced when Lee was around seven years old and her mother soon met a new man. And his last name was also Lee and her mother and this new guy, they ended up like they had a relationship and then they ended up having a baby together and it was a little girl, a little sister for Lee and they named her Jessie and this was Lee's first sibling. So she really wanted to have the same last name as her sibling. So Jessica Lee. So she asked her mother if she could actually change her last name from Mears to Lee as well and it was the exact same spelling and everything so she changed it to Lee Lee and this was pretty unconventional and it's quite like a cute name and she actually chose to keep this name even after her mother and that guy they were no longer you know dating anymore. Eventually her mom would go on to marry another guy named Brad Shearman and Brad would go on to become her stepfather. So at the time this case takes place, it's November 1989, Lee lives with her mother, her sister, Jessie, and her stepfather in Fern Bay, Newcastle. She attended Newcastle High as an eighth grader. And according to her grandmother, even though Lee had attended so many different schools growing up because her family kept moving around, she loved school, she loved going to school, and she loved animals, and she wanted to be a vet growing up when she grew up. <laughs> Lee had like short shoulder length, sort of dark hair. She had a ton of freckles and she was really cute. She was just a normal teenage girl going through normal teenage issues, boys, friendship issues, things like that. And she just really wanted to fit in. I mean, most of us do at that age. When she wasn't studying, Lee actually spent a bunch of time um, with her grandmother at her grandmother's house. And she was super close with her grandmother. And it's n it's apparent that she spent like almost every weekend with her grandmother, even school holidays. And she would also hang out with her cousin, Tracy, who she was really close with as well. The two of them, they would like go out, you know, watch movies, go roller skating, things like that. Things that just teenagers do. So on November 3rd, 1989, there was a boy in her school, Jason Robertson. He was having his birthday, like he was celebrating his sweet 16th. And now obviously he was a grade or two above Lee's, but he was known to be having this huge party. There would be drugs, there would be alcohol, and it was like known there was going to be no adult supervision, which is obviously not a good recipe for a teen party. And this party was going to be held at North Stockton Surf Club, which is like a like it probably had like a like a hall or like a venue there, which is normally rented out for parties. And this feels so familiar to me because in high school, I went to a lot of parties like this. Over here in Australia, we tend to like have a lot of parties at like yacht clubs, surf clubs, council halls, even like church halls. Like they rent it out to you. You can have your own bar, your own food, or you can like set up a tab and have their alcohol and then like their food, things like that. And parents kind of are usually cool about underage drinking, like as long as they're present. There was no party that I went to that, where there wasn't at least two parents there. I don't think I've been to an underage party where there's like free flowing liquor and like no adult is there. I feel like that was kind of weird. Like what were Jason's parents thinking? But that's what the party allegedly was like. Some say there were 60 kids in attendance. Some say, you know, there were a hundred kids in attendance, but either way, it's like a lot of kids there for one party. 
And the majority of the kids attending the party were around Jason's age, so around 16. But there were also kids who were Lee's age who were attending, so around the age of 14. And then there was also allegedly like some 10 year olds and things like that. Like these 10 year olds are usually either like super grown 10 year olds or they think they're grown or they're like siblings of someone. And then, you know, they have to come along and like tag along to these events. But it's insane that a 10 year old was allowed to come to this party with no adult supervision, like... There was also a local band called Cardinal Sin that was playing that night. So clearly it was going to be this like huge event. And Lee also apparently had a crush on one of the band's like bandmates. Bandmates? (laughs) Is that what they call them? It was going to be a beautiful, warm summer night. And obviously Lee was so desperate to go. She really wanted to go. And Lee was actually given like a proper invite to this party. She definitely was invited. And she asked her mother and her mom was just like, "Mm -mm." like, I don't know about this. She was literally like, please, mom, this is like my first ever teenage party that I've been invited to. She tells her mom, like, there's going to be adults at this party. So, you know, don't even stress about it. And I guess that's kind of like somewhat true. But what she didn't tell her mom is that the adults that were going to come to the party were in the form of two bouncers. Matthew Webster, who was 18 years old and he was known as Fat Matt and Guy Wilson, who was 19 years old. They were literally the only two people who were over the age of 18 and they're there to act as like bouncers. And we all know how responsible 18 year olds are. And I still, I like, I find that insane that this party is even being thrown with these two guys as the only adults. Like, I don't know. Like, I've never, ever heard of that. And 18, 19, you're not even an adult. Like, please, you're not even an adult. So Lee was allowed to go to this party. Her mom let her go. But her only rule was you need to come home by 11 p.m. So Lee's mother, she drops her off at like the local pizza place so Lee can meet her friends and then they can like walk on to the party together and like, you know, hang out, things you do when you're a kid. So they had a quick bite to eat at the pizza place and then they ended up heading on over to the party and they arrived at the party at around 7.30 p.m. Matthew, he was working the door when they arrived and he stamps Lee and her friend's hands with like a green stamp when they arrived to enter the venue. Inside there was the band and everyone just seemed to be having a really, really good time. It just looked like a typical teenage party. Now, the venue did not actually allow for alcohol to be, you know, consumed inside it, especially due to no adults being present. So there wasn't any of that, but there was plenty like this. So I'll see if I can like post an aerial shot of this venue. It's like a little surf club thing. And then the beach is like right there. So there wasn't any alcohol, you know, inside the venue, but there was plenty of drugs and alcohol, you know, right outside the venue. The party definitely like spilled out into like the outdoor area and then like the local beach and the bushes and things like that. I mean, you guys know what teenage parties are like. It was exactly like that. So around 8.30 p.m., the police actually arrive to, like, I don't know if this is common in other countries, but the police, they drive by or, you know, if they know that that a party is taking place, they usually just, like, scope out the area. They just make sure everything's going well and there's no issues. Like, I've been to plenty of those. However, it's rumored, though, that the people, like the people supplying the alcohol and drugs and stuff, they were actually tipped off that police were going to be, you know, arriving. So they were able to hide everything and sort of pretend that everything was going well. So police, when they came and inspected the venue, they had no clue that like anything, you know, bad was going on. So the police didn't stay long. So as soon as they left, the party just, you know, continued on as usual and yeah the alcohol and the drugs just started flowing straight away again. Lee and her you know minor friends were given an entire bottle of Jim Beam which that's something it's a whiskey but that's something that like is weird to me because alcohol's not cheap especially when you're a kid like that so I wonder who was supplying and paying for the alcohol enough to give like a small group of girls an entire bottle of whiskey like that usually doesn't happen but anyway they gave them this bottle of alcohol and they gave them coke so they could like mix it together and reportedly there was a bunch a bunch a bunch of alcohol purchased like pre-purchased already for this party and given out to all the miners and again I don't know who purchased this alcohol I'm sure everyone you know involved would just deny accountability as they don't want to get in trouble but I feel like this would have been important to know who purchased the alcohol and allegedly this alcohol was purchased with the goal of trying to get the miners who were attending drunk 
And it worked because Lee was not a drinker and this was one of her first times like ever really drinking alcohol. So she became intoxicated super quickly and Jim Beam, oof. So according to another party goer, Matthew, he, you know, the 18 year old bouncer, Fat Matt. So he apparently approached someone else at the party and he said, hey, we're gonna get Lee pissed and we're all gonna go through her. And what that essentially means is suggesting that they're all gonna get Lee drunk and then they're gonna all take turns assaulting her or, or in their eyes having sex with her. Now you would hope that this is a joke, but it wasn't. And the first boy to actually go ahead with this like opportunity, I guess, was a 15 year old boy. And he's not, you know, been named due to being a minor. And I hate that fact because this was not a mistake. This was a calculated plan. The boy was quoted to have told his friends, I'm going to go and F Lee. And obviously I'm guessing Lee didn't know. So she walked off with him and he, you know, was with her. He clearly knew she was intoxicated. They walked off towards the beach and witnesses say that Lee was so intoxicated that he had to even carry her at one point like carry her to the beach. The 15 year old boy in um, official documentation was referred um, to as NC1 because he was underage. And in, you know, Australia, the age, or well, in New South Wales, the age of consent at the time was 16. I think it still is 16. So anyone under the age of 16 cannot consent to any sexual acts. Even if they agree to do it, it's not legal. So Lee is, you know, the minor in this situation. So is the boy technically. And, um, I mean, even if she was 18, she was so intoxicated. Even if she said, yes, is that really consensual? Like she doesn't know what the hell she's talking about. You know, she was so drunk. She had to be carried. Like it's crazy. So now we're really going to get into things, you know, that happened that night and it's about sexual assault. So again, I just want to give you a heads up that the following events are probably distressing, um, and triggering and yeah, we'll be talking about sexual assault. So if that's going to be, you know, bothersome, maybe skip ahead. So now the crazy thing is on the beach, we don't really know what happened. Um, when I say don't know what happened, we don't know the details, but at the beach, this unnamed boy, he sexually assaulted Lee. Now she was intoxicated. And as she stumbled back from, you know, her walk with him that I'm sure she thought was just a walk. Lee was really upset and she was actually bleeding between her legs. She was visibly crying. She was really upset and she was almost hysterical, like looking for someone to help her. Very few people at this party try to console her and she flat out tells some of the people like I've been raped. And I don't know, like correct me if I'm wrong, but I always wonder is when they say the victim was bleeding between her legs, like, is it visible blood? Like we can see blood dripping down or it was just more so like, is it cause she was a virgin? Do you know what I mean? Like, do you know what I'm trying to say? I just don't understand um, how there can be that much blood. Not saying that there wasn't. I'm just, I just don't understand how there is that much. Like this boy was that violent with her, a 15 year old. Like, and then not only that, like you're raping this girl and then you see blood and you keep going. I just don't understand. I never understand that. So there were several boys that Lee actually went up to and said like, you know, this happened to me and she kind of like reported it to them. But to be honest, they just really didn't know what to do with that information. And most of them were like intoxicated anyway. So they kind of just looked at her and were like, whatever. And most of them just ignored her, which blows my mind. And let me tell you, like, I have been saying like, you know, when you're drunk, like, you know what you're doing, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Even if you're young and you've never drank before, things like that, you know, you're not supposed to be drinking half the time, like when you're, when you're underage drinking. So you're even more like paranoid. You know what I mean? So if somebody at a party that you're going to, that's supposed to be a fun party comes up to you and tells you this, like, don't you snap out of it even more? Like, that's just my theory. It's just, I find it unbelievable how some people behave when drunk. She apparently is already bleeding between her legs from this 15 year old loser which even if he was intoxicated, doesn't give him any excuse to be like, oh, I didn't know what I was doing. Like that is stupid. That's a stupid excuse for me. And then no one helped her. I mean, I understand the kids being too afraid to call their own parents. Like they don't want to tell their parents they were at a party where, the, where this happened, but why not call Lee's parents? Why not call Lee's friends? Like whoever she came to the party with, why not just help her out? If this had been done at this point, this case wouldn't even be what this case is, point blank. So obviously now whoever was outdoors at the party. They now start talking about what happened to Lee and the news starts like spreading about what happened to Lee. And the news even spreads to the two, you know, chaperones of the party, Matthew and Guy. And while these two adults, bouncers, should have actually done something to help Lee, you know, call the police, 
Coley's parents like do something about it, they actually decided to do something even more unimaginable. So allegedly, after Matthew hears this, he goes ahead and he tells another boy at the party, Lee's a bit of a slut. Why don't all of us have a go at her? Now, that is just so sick. And if you actually think about what his statement is saying, he's basically trying to like get approval from like the other boys that his thoughts about what he wants to do to Lee seems like a normal, normal thing to say. And I don't know how, you know, he would even want to. He's 18 years old, a 14 year old at the time would probably look like a little baby to you. You guys remember when you were 18, you think like anyone like under 15 is like a baby, even under 16 is like a baby. And he's almost like, hey, like I want to assault her. Like, do you guys want to assault her too? Like, is this a normal thing? And almost like he's kind of asking people to join in. So he's like not the only one. So then Guy, you know, the other adult, he is 19. He walks up to Lee almost like trying to console her, but he wasn't there to console her. He puts his arm around her and Lee is at this point upset, crying. And instead of helping her, he asks her, hey, can I have a go at you? Who raised these boys? So she says no. And she like pushes him away from her. And, you know, because that like embarrasses him, he takes his beer and he pushes it, uh, pours it all over Lee, all over Lee, who had just been raped. After this, he then pushes her to the ground. And then several other boys, like up to 10 boys, including Matthew, walk over to Lee and she's on the ground now. They begin like yelling like slurs at her and like taunting her, calling her a slut, pouring more beer on her, kicking her. And this, you know, apparently went on for a good five minutes with these boys doing this to her. And and there are other people like standing around watching this happen. People who, you know, were watching this happen said that they heard the boys yelling at Lee, like, take that, you slut. And like, just being really like horrible. And keep in mind, all of this is happening while the party is still like running wild. And not a single person comes to help Lee. I don't know where her friends were at this point, but not a single person comes to help her. Okay, fine. I get that they don't want the group of boys to turn around and, you know, attack them or something like that. I'm sure there were girls watching going, what the fuck, you know, but, and they didn't want the boys to turn on them, but you could literally just call the police, go somewhere secret, call the police. Like there were no, were there mobile phones back then? No. So just go back, call the police, call her parents. Again, another opportunity for this to just stop right in its tracks but nope that's why we're telling this story so eventually and I'm guessing Lee you know was kind of not taking this behavior but it was hard for her because she was so intoxicated you know what I mean so eventually she gets up and she stumbles away from the group of guys and they're still obviously laughing at her throwing beer at her and she picks up one of the empty beer bottles and she throws it like in a direction it doesn't hit any of the boys but then in response Guy He um, grabs another beer bottle and he throws it at Lee and he actually hits her. It hits her leg. Now at this point, you know how like when you drink alcohol, sometimes like it just only escalates. It doesn't like you can't get sober. Like it just takes a while. And I'm guessing this all happened in a really short period of time. So Lee is still severely intoxicated at this point. It just takes a while for the alcohol to leave your system. You know, she's been raped, brutally assaulted, covered in spit, beer, and she's bleeding. And again, I just wonder where her friends were at this stage. Like, were they just too intoxicated too? Were they partying somewhere? Like, I just don't, I just don't know. I mean, as her friend alone, I would have panicked when I saw her walking off with this like boy when she was that intoxicated. Like, I've definitely been in situations like that. And I go and I check on my friend and not blaming her friends. I'm just saying it's just, it's just wild. Like, where were they? So after this, Lee is last seen leaving the surf like clubhouse. She's super intoxicated. She was seen vomiting. And she was seen walking towards the beach um, at around 10.30 p.m. And that was the last time Lee was seen. So Lee's stepfather, Brad, in like a weird, strange coincidence, around the same time, like 10.30-ish, he arrives to pick up Lee. Because remember, Lee's mom let her go to this party as long as she, you know, left by 11 or came home by 11. So Lee's stepfather comes and he's ready to pick her up. And he goes around the venue looking for Lee. He looks for her inside the clubhouse, doesn't find her there. He asks like a bunch of people, like, have you seen Lee? Things like that. But like everyone is so drunk, intoxicated. Like it's a, it's an absolute mess. He claimed that like half the teens were like not even dressed properly and like really incoherent and no one could really give him clear answers to where Lee might be. So at this point, I think after looking for Lee for a few minutes, uh, Lee's stepfather is like annoyed at this point and he assumes that maybe just like Lee went to her friend's house to stay for the evening. So Brad, he leaves the venue and he goes home without Lee. 
Now, this is something I find so weird. If my parents ever came to pick me up from a party and they never ever did, they would always send my brothers. Even if it was my brothers, there's absolutely no way they would leave the venue without me. Like if I was supposed to be there, I said, I'm coming home. Like there's no chance. And my dad would have kicked my ass. Like there's no chance. So, and my brothers probably would have been afraid to come home without me because my dad would have kicked their ass. So I just find it like, I don't know. Like it's, isn't that weird to you guys? Like, again, not blaming her stepfather. I'm just saying it's like so crazy, you know, like she was only 14. You, you can't just assume without knowing anything that she went off and did something else. Like she's not grown to make these, like make her own decisions. Like I'm just going to go stay at Jessica's house today. Like it just doesn't make sense. And I feel bad that he did that because how is he ever going to forgive himself for what I'm about to tell you? So now it's the next morning and Lee is still not home. Okay. It's been hours at this point since they have seen or heard from Lee. So obviously I'm guessing now the family is starting to panic. Now her parents are also like, apart from their panic, they're also getting pissed off because they're like, Lee, she's so irresponsible. Like she just did her own thing. Like they're probably just thinking they're going to like yell at her and like get her in trouble when she comes home. Now at around 9.30 a.m., Lee's stepfather, along with a few other concerned parents, form a search party and they go out and actually begin to look for Lee. They go back to the area of the clubhouse, start looking around there. And at this point, they're thinking, you know what? Maybe some of the teenagers like passed out on the beach. Maybe Lee had too much to drink and she's just like passed out on the beach. So that's where they begin their search. So they're walking on the beach and then one of the like searchers, he sees on the beach what he thinks is like a mannequin and he thinks it's like a dummy or a mannequin. And he sees it lying like between the sand dunes. So he points everyone into that direction. He's like, come, come take a look at this. Like as everyone gets nearer, they realize that this is actually Lee's body. She's lifeless. She's lying on her back with her legs apart. She was completely naked except for her socks and shoes. Her shorts had been pulled down to her ankles. Her shirt and bra were found like next to her body. And the way her clothes were found, they were found like completely twisted up and reeking of alcohol. And there was a large like six kilo, 12 pound rock that was right next to her body that was also covered in blood. What's wild is that her face was barely unrecognizable. So you and me both are guessing that the rock was used on her face. Blood spatter was found like 2.8 or three meters away from her body. Do you know how far that is? That's far. And the invitation to Jason's party was actually still found in the back of her shorts, like the back pocket. It's like so disturbing. Now we can all assume what happened, but just the fact that this young girl, her lifeless naked body is just like left there is just so upsetting. And the fact that her legs were apart would indicate to me that she died while being assaulted. Cause you know, your natural, re like uh, for me as a woman, your natural reflex is to like shut your legs, you know, like, so the fact that they were found like apart is just so, you can imagine what she was going through. So police were called to the scene where, you know, they taped off the area to collect evidence and Lee's body was actually in a very terrible condition. Her skull was completely caved in, which was obviously seemingly done through that bloody rock. And from the evidence, it was clear to the investigators that she was actually struck with the rock multiple, multiple times. There were also marks on her neck which showed that she had been choked, though it was actually the rock that had ultimately led to her death, not the choking. Additionally, she had multiple hemorrhages, injuries to her jaw, liver, ribs, and her right kidney. Her blood alcohol level, I believe, was like 0 um, 0.128. And in Australia, to drive, your blood alcohol reading should be under 0 0.05, 0 0.05. So this amount of alcohol in someone's system, especially a 14 year old who had never, you know, really drank before would have caused like significant impairment, loss of coordination, and obviously loss of good judgment. During the autopsy, it was also like found that Lee had suffered a very intense and violent sexual assault. And that most likely at the time of the attack, Lee was a virgin. And again, it's about to get a bit graphic here. She had deep bruising to the left wall of her vagina. 
extensive bruising to her hymen and two tears. One was like 20 millimeters, like nearly an inch long. Okay. It's an inch like that long tear to her vulva. And it was, I mean, I wouldn't say speculated. It was found that these like bad injuries were most likely caused by um, an object being used on her and specifically a glass beer bottle. There was no semen found in her or near her body. And I think I say this every single time, but I just can't help it. Like what is up with men and wanting to mutilate women's genitals? Inserting strange objects in there like as part of the assault. Like let me insert something up your ass, okay? I'm so sick of it. It's like they hate women and they just wanna destroy them. Like go away then. Don't, don't be around women. Go away. Go to an island. Live there alone. So 20 detectives were assigned to this case, although the squad was released, uh, reduced to just like 10 members a few weeks later. The investigation started right away with everyone, with the police interviewing everyone that had attended the party from the night before, which at the time was super complicated because the majority of the people that went there were drunk, high, intoxicated. So throughout speaking to whoever they could, the police realized that this party was actually a really wild party and not subdued like the police who had come and, um, you know, had a, like they looked around, it wasn't what they had reported it to be, like just a normal teenage party. Like it was actually way wilder than what they believed it to be. Police had to get statements from more than 40 people, cross check all their stories, make sure, you know, that people were telling them the truth. They were expected to interview like 20 more people because that's like 60 people. And all of this led them pretty quickly to their main suspects, Matthew and Guy, as well as that unnamed 15 year old NC1 who allegedly sexually assaulted Lee earlier that evening on the beach. The good news about this case is that there were a ton of witnesses there that night, right? So it shouldn't be hard to find out what happened, but this also is what makes this case really sad because so many witnesses and nobody did anything. Some of the witnesses said they, you know, they had seen Lee, you know, on the beach stumbling. She was intoxicated. And some of them were like, I'm not really sure I even believe Lee's story. At the time in that area, the general consensus was if a young woman is drunk or had a reputation, she basically deserved or was asking for whatever happened to her to happen. Great. Police knew it had to be looked at closely because even if the incident wasn't related to murder, like what happened to Lee that night? But how can it not be related to murder? I mean, she's murdered. But I guess maybe they were thinking she died of like alcohol intoxication or something like that. So now this 15 year old unnamed boy, he straight up just admitted to having sex with Lee. He was like, yeah, I had sex with Lee. But he said that it was her that initiated it and it was completely consensual. However, there were clearly witnesses at the party who said Lee was too intoxicated to even walk by herself, let alone consent to a sexual act. Plus the witnesses who, you know, told police that Lee had been walking around telling everyone that she had been raped by this boy. Take the fact that Lee was intoxicated off the table, okay? Let's let's take that off the table. Either way, she was 14 years old. She's too young. And I also read that if two minors, because in this situation, the boy is also a minor, if two minors are engaging in the sexual act, then I believe that they both can be like put up for statutory rape charges. So in my opinion, he can take that consensual sex story and shove it up his 15 year old ass. Guy, the 19 year old, he actually initially just denied doing anything. He was just like, I didn't do anything. I wasn't part of anything. He also said like he didn't even have any interaction with Lee, but again, there's witnesses, you dumbass. So he had to change his story. And he wanted to do so before like the information would leak out and, you know, people would tell his story for him. So in another interview, he admitted to throwing beer on Lee, spitting on her, and then that he was the one that threw that empty beer bottle at Lee. Matthew, the 18 year old fat Matt, he also admitted to, you know, throwing beer on Lee and spitting on her and, you know, saying these things to her, but he completely denied ever having any sexual contact with Lee or, you know, being involved with her murder. His story was that after the party, he left the venue, went to a nearby pub and had some pizza. A few days later, he changed his story about the pub, obviously, because there probably wasn't any witnesses at the pub to see him eat some pizza. 
And he said after the party, he just went for a walk. Then he also stated that two 14 year old girls then approached him and NC1, the 15 year old, and asked him to supply them with some hash. And that he gave those two girls like a small, like a couple bags of weed. And he exchanged all of this for $20. And all three of these main suspects, NC1, um, Matthew and Guy, were all then asked for blood samples. And the sad thing about this is a lot of this happens, um, ba- a lot, well, a lot of this happened back when DNA was still fairly new and in, in its infancy. So even with the blood samples, like what could they really do with it? They wouldn't be able to match anything other than like, okay, well, you know, the blood found here and the blood found there is the same type of blood as these guys. And, you know, well, not even as them, more so as the blood type. So if Guy and Matt had both type O, well, how do you know which one's blood it was, essentially? So the suspects were also asked to hand over the clothing they were wearing on that night. So... Like, don't wash it, just here's the clothing. But Matthew actually ended up giving them a completely different set of clothing that he didn't even wear that night. So now there was no physical evidence to connect any of the three suspects directly to Lee's murder, which is just crazy. But that's obviously because of DNA um, technology. And I think one of the saddest things about this case is that no one wanted to speak up. Not the kids who attended the party, not the parents, like... I'm sure some of the kids would would have gone and told their parents like what happened or what they saw, but their parents just didn't want the kids to be involved in the case. And I think they were just like, oh my God, like it's a murder, like just stay out of it kind of thing. And I understand that they didn't want them to get involved. And I can totally imagine my parents being like, just shut up, just don't say anything. But that's because my dad is a lawyer, but like at the same time, what if it was your client, you know, like what if it was your daughter? What if it was your friend? Wouldn't you want someone to speak up and just be like, this is what I saw? Like, There was over 60 people there. At least two people saw something. Some parents wouldn't even allow their kids, because you know, um, underage, you have to get parental permission. Some parents wouldn't even allow their kids to speak to to the police at all. And I think it was more so had to do with police distrust. Like they didn't want their kids to get in trouble for things that they didn't do or like to be pinned for, for the crime to be pinned on them. And I, I do understand that. For a while, there was actually a really like sick rumor going around that it was actually Lee's stepfather who killed her. And that he had been sleeping with her for months and, you know, to cover up what he had been doing, he murdered her at this party and made it look, you know, like everyone else did it. Crazy thing is police actually looked into her father as one of the suspects, but then they had zero evidence to back this up. So they just dropped it. But without people coming up with like re- what really happened, the rumor mill just like went wild. There were talks of a serial killer in the area, gangs targeting women. However, obviously there were no real connections made to any of these rumors. So on November 15th, 1989, both Matthew and Guy were charged with um, assault on Lee. And this was more so relating to, you know, throwing the beer on her, spitting on her, things like that. And also Matthew got an additional charge for applying the weed to the miners. And the police hoped that, you know, charging them with these things was going to get more people to come forward and like let them know what really happened. However, that didn't happen. And NC1, he was released into the custody of his parents. And I don't understand how they didn't have any other like reasons to hold them, but there were so many witnesses saying what they had done, sorry, what they had done to Lee, but that was the most that they could do. Matthew and Guy were held on bail overnight, but they were just released like the next morning. So on 16th November, 1969, Matthew, he uh, pleads guilty to the assault charge as well as the charge for supplying the cannabis, the weed to a minor. And then he also just kept denying like he had anything to do with Lee's murder. Guy did not enter any plea regarding his assault charge and he was sentenced to six months in jail. The 15 year old, he pleaded not guilty to um, sex with a minor, but he was still convicted of that crime. However, after his conviction, he goes on to appeal his conviction, um, gets a new judge and says, you know, that's not true. Like it was consensual. And the freaking judge, the new judge agreed with him. So his charges were dropped. Like, wow, all these witness testimonies of, you know, Lee could barely stand, could barely walk. How can she consent to this? And the freaking judge still agreed. Like, I don't understand some people in the justice system. NC1, his punishment ended up being um, just community service for rape. Now, what's really disgusting is because of this stupid judge, when he overturned NC1's um, conviction, stating that now on paper, the sex act, the, the rape that he conducted on Lee is consensual. After this, you know, 
happened, people in the area just started like attacking Lee. Basically it's Lee's fault. Even though Lee was the one who was murdered in a brutal, horrific, disgusting way and obviously sexually assaulted, they were trash talking Lee. They blamed her for these three boys' actions, stating that, oh, she's just the town bike and everyone, you know, wanted to ride on her. They even called her a good time girl. The way people began to talk about this, you know, incident was more so that like it was just a like instead of murder, it was just a party that had like gone wrong. And I can't imagine how Lee's parents would have been feeling throughout all of this, like hearing, because, you know, it was a small town and hearing about, um, sorry, a small community and hearing about like, you know, that's how people are viewing your daughter who was murdered, who was 14 years old. And as you can imagine, the frustration did come out in an actual incident. On January 31st, 1990, there was actually an altercation between Lee's stepfather, Brad, and um, Guy Wilson. Brad reportedly punched Guy in the head three times after Guy made a comment to Brad stating, oh, we're going to get Lee's sister next. Like, it's basically a confession, right? And what a freaking asshole. So Brad had to be arrested. He he pleaded guilty to assault. But I think he did the right thing because even after this girl was murdered, forget murder, she's dead, Guy still had the balls to talk like that. Meaning that these stupid guys don't even believe what they did was wrong. They don't. They don't get it. So now at this point, Lee's assault has been like addressed, you know, they're charging them for assault, but the rape was dismissed and police at this point still didn't have any evidence to charge anyone in particular with murder. It's literally been months at this stage and no one is talking. So in February 1990, the police went as far as taking Matthew and NC1 into the station together, hoping that, you know, when we have them together, they're going to say something, you know, something incriminating, but they both didn't say anything. I'm guessing at this point they had been pretty well trained by their lawyers. However, later on, during his third and final interview, Matthew just decided to finally confess to everything. He told police, well, I did it. I just can't believe it, but it just, it sort of, it just happened. So his statement is pretty long and he like details what happened that night. So I'll read you exactly what he said. So he said, I went to look for my beers and I saw Lee sitting down on the grass. My beers weren't there. Somebody must have pinched them. And then I walked up to Lee and she carried on with her normal shit and I tried to get onto her. Then we walked down to the bushes and I pulled her clothes off and I pulled my shorts down and I put my finger in her I thought I was right for a route. And then she started pushing me away saying, don't. I lost my temper and I did what I did. So police then asked him like, what do you mean you did what you did? And he stated, she was punching and pushing me. And I grabbed her by the throat and I said, don't. And I choked her a bit. She stopped punching and I grabbed the rock and I killed her. Now, I don't understand how that even escalated to that point. If you really think about what his statement is, if that is the truth, it doesn't even make sense. It really doesn't make sense. Like he apparently didn't even rape her. So then what did you do all this for? Like, it doesn't make sense. His story doesn't add up. So Matthew says he killed Lee because he was afraid that she was going to tell on him. Tell about what? So he was arrested for Lee's murder and looking at his statement and comparing with the evidence, clearly it's clear that he's left a lot of stuff out. Lee was sexually assaulted with something similar to the shape of a beer bottle. He was looking for his beers, but he never mentions anything about this. And I am so sure that he did also rape her. Um, maybe he, you know, couldn't finish. That's why there was no semen found anywhere. But it just doesn't make sense that these guys all wanted to have sex with her and then none of them did. I just don't believe that. I don't believe it. So now even at the trial, there was a ton of information just left out. Like the truth wasn't really told. Matthew was just painted as like this gentle giant who just had a little bit too much to drink at the, at the party. And, you know, things went horribly wrong. And, you know, he kills Lee out of, the, out of fear. He was so afraid of getting into trouble. Even though the fact that it was him that was the one that suggested to all the other boys, like, let's get ready for a gangbang. Like, was that taken into account? That was mentioned by the witnesses, but yet... He's still a gentle giant. Lee, on the other hand, during the trial was painted as like this promiscuous girl who went to this party with the intention of getting drunk and hooking up with a bunch of guys. Where is the evidence of that? Oh, did she also go there to die too? So it's her fault, right? Very little was talked about, very little about the abuse that she was subjected to, the violence that she was subjected to prior to her death. What about that? She asked for that too, right? There were at least 10 boys who were involved in like spitting on her, kicking her, you know, throwing beer on her. And the weird thing is even one of the band members was involved in this. 
none of these guys ever faced any charges. And one of the band members, you are there to like throw it, like you're there to perform at this event and that's what you do. In the end, um, Matthew Webster, Fat Matt, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison, but he was out in 14. Guy was charged for his part in the assault and he was surprisingly only sentenced to six months in prison. The 15 year old boy, like I said before, was just given community service. I think it was like a hundred hours of community service. And even with all the witnesses at the party who heard Lee say she had been raped, who saw the blood on her, who saw her super intoxicated walking off with NC1, no one till this date has ever been charged with Lee's rape or even really her sexual assault. They're saying that NC1, he was like his reasoning for not getting getting like severely punished was because the people that were saying we saw him with, you know, walking with Lee and she was intoxicated. It's more so like hearsay. So it's not substantial enough evidence to charge him for rape. And I mean, if he raped her, did he use a condom? Like why was there no semen found on her body? I find that it's like they planned it, you know, it's crazy. Or maybe this 15 year old as well couldn't finish because he's 15, you know, he probably panicked. He probably just did it for the hell of it. And he probably panicked and couldn't finish doing what he did, which is thank God he didn't. But at the same time, he didn't leave any evidence there. I just don't, and that's the thing I don't get. Like, so if he raped her, I mean, I don't know how a rape takes place. Is there that much time for him to put a condom on? No DNA. I mean, the the fact that she was also bleeding, I'm guessing that was pretty rough. Like, what about finger marks, bruises on her body where she was held down? Like, can't they, like, match? Oh, but then the DNA sucked back then. Because if they could match, like, the size of the hands and things like that, bruises on her body. I'm, I feel like I've seen that done, you know, before. And the truth of what really happened to Lee and all those people who participated in it or if there were any witnesses and what really happened with Matthew or if Guy was involved, like, none of that has ever really been found out or released. Lee's mother said that when she asked the detectives, like, well, what's happening? Like, why aren't, you know, these other people being charged? And why is this case not like being taken further? The detective apparently told Lee's mother, well, do you know how much it costs to run an investigation? And I literally did another case, like in Australia, where the police said the same thing. Like, I like, what, do they not have the budget? Like, why are Australian police in the past, at least, behaving this way? It's so gross. And this is another case of an, like a really botched police job, because at first I thought the police were doing a really great job, like interviewing everyone and like really being on top of it. But it has been now speculated or I guess evidence that the DNA that was collected from the three suspects, none of it was even tested. Why? Because it cost too much. None of the clothing that was taken from the boys were ever tested. And then Matthew's confession allows him to tell his own version of what had happened that night. If the DNA was actually tested with whatever limited testing they had, maybe there would have been like a bigger picture of what had happened. I don't believe Matthew's story at all. I'm sure there's some truth to it, but I feel like a lot more happened that he's not saying. And I'm sure there were clear, like, I'm sure there were others, you know, involved at that, you know, during Lee's last moments. And I'm surprised that Matthew never implicated any of them. I feel like Guy was involved. Matthew said that he walked to the beach with Lee, but witnesses state that they saw Lee walking to the beach by herself and then they saw Matthew and Guy leaving the surf club together. So even if it was just the two of them, I feel like there's definitely more to it. And yeah, it's just not right. The autopsy report, I forgot to say earlier, also showed that like there were several strikes to Lee's head that came from different directions and were probably inflicted with different items, which like... That alone indicates that there was more than one perpetrator. Matthew was released on 10th June 2004 after serving 14 and a half years in jail. He was arrested for assault right away once he was released and then he went back to jail. And then he was released again a few months later. Over the years, Lee's mother, other organizations, and even some of the police members have been like, let's reopen this investigation and look deeper into it. Particularly due to the fact that it was shoddy police work and the fact that no one has ever been charged for Lee's rape. And I believe that even though Matthew <clears throat> went to prison for her murder, he can still be charged for her rape. The actual level of violence, sexual violence that Lee experienced was all but like erased from her trial. It was just didn't happen. It appeared that the judge at the time was only given limited information regarding the post-mortem examination of Lee. And this information that was given was only like the small parts that would actually corroborate Matthew's confession the rocks you know from different angles I don't even know if the beer bottle was ever submitted to the judge so in the end nothing was done further and no one was charged I mean when you end such a brutal case which with such a shitty ending it's so disappointing I mean I'm sad I'm mad for the family I feel the more I look into the like Australian cases the more I'm like what the fuck is going on with the justice system like people have made comments on my videos before being like 
like the Australian legal system is a joke, but I never really thought about it. I read further that, you know, the majority of the DNA that was collected was never really tested and that rock with the blood on it, like clear negligence of the clothes. What about the beer bottles in the area? I mean, Guy's shirt even apparently had blood on it. I just don't get it. Like if they believed a beer bottle was, you know, used in her rape, why didn't they collect all the beer bottles around her body and test it? Fingerprints. I'm sure they had fingerprint technology back then. I feel like the rape, not just the one by NC1 where he badly, you know, like made her bleed. It's clear that her genitals were so badly damaged that couldn't have happened from just one guy. Unless that one guy did multiple, multiple things to her over a period of time. Her sexual assault is just being washed away and the audacity of people to even label her as promiscuous is amazing. I feel this case should be talked about, especially with teenagers, to show them what to do and what not to do at social gatherings. This happened like decades ago. Can you imagine the things that even happen in today's parties? Like I remember when, you know, I was going out, it wasn't that long ago, but you know, and um, things were wild back then, but it wasn't as crazy as what I believe to hear about now. Like this, what happened to Lee is way more insane than what happened, like what's ever happened to an, like a teenage party that I ever went to but yeah people do drugs people get drunk people have sex like kids have sex that's just what people do unfortunately I wish they didn't but they do and I feel like if one of those children at that party in front of Lee was taught to go and report things to an adult when things are just being taken out of control it's okay to go and seek help you're not a snitch or you know if you're worried about someone or worried about your own safety then they should be taught to leave and go call for help like now everyone has a mobile phone there's no excuse that this should happen all of this could have been avoided if just one teenager was taught to do the right thing in a way so rest in peace lily it's a horrible case so let me know your thoughts on today's case down below guys i would love to know what you think and I hope you enjoyed today's video. I will see you in the next one. Besitos. Bye.